This is Twit. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Once again, I have a really good friend of mine on the hot seat. Turns out I've known this man for, I'm not going to tell you how long I've known this man. It's been a long, a long time. time. A long time. His name is Mark Silver. He is... Um, he knows more about photography than, you know, than I just a lot about photography. He's probably <laughs> forgotten more about photography than I know right now. So, so he knows his stuff. He's an ace interviewer. He's got an amazing YouTube channel and he writes books on photography as well. And one of his books that's out there is called Advancing Your Photography. We're going to talk about one chapter from that book. The five, yeah, that one, five stages of photography and just what that looks like. So, Mark Silber, welcome to the show, man. It's good to see you. It's good to catch up. How are you doing? Frederick, always good to be with you. And yeah, we go back, you know, it's like we're in the teens, how far we go back to where we first met when we were doing a show. Our My first interview with uh, Ansel Adams' son and at That's Ansel's right. home. Wow, yep. was that cool? In his dark room. Him. We got to go yeah. in and touch Ansel Adams' enlarger. That it's like sound sacred. Right, but it's, yeah. <laughs> we got to, we got That's a whole story into itself. Yeah, it is so cool. So Michael Adams, if you're watching this, hello. We got to catch up. Yeah. Hello, um, Michael. Yeah, that was good. So yeah, the, so there's a there's a ton of stuff to talk about. You know, like I said, we have a, a long and storied history of knowing each other and kind of moving through the industry. But you you have been you've kind of hung your hat on educating photographers and kind of yeah. sharing your learnings to shortcut their learnings right down the road. That's a good way uh, of putting and, it. And you've built Advancing Your Photography. So talk about that whole brand, the whole Advancing Your Photography brand. What's that all about? Yeah, what it's all about, Frederick. You know, a long time ago, I was doing workshops, live workshops. And, and one time somebody videoed me and it had legs. And all of a sudden I thought, wow, you know, instead of just teaching to however many people are in this room, and that room could be huge, it could be, you know, WPPI size, or it could be 30 people, you're still limited to the number of people you can reach, right, physically. And all of a sudden the video world opened up that, and I thought, wow, this is an amazing way to teach people. But I like to go not just what comes out of my mouth and what's my experience, but what's worked for other, you know, major photographers, starting with Ansel Adams and Annie Leibovitz, believe it or not. Those were the first two <laughs> videos that we created. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I tried to basically distill from what I learned from them into very bite-sized pieces. And, uh, you know, I've done over a thousand hours of interviews. Wow. That's a lot of work. It is. It is. So, I'm right up there with you, buddy. I'm right up there. <laughs> it's up there, you know, and who wants to watch a thousand? I'm not going to make people watch a thousand hours of interviews to learn what I learned. So I distill that down. That's that's the AYP brand is like I'm distilling wisdom that I've also tested myself. I know it works. And I put it in the form of, you know, either my books or my classes. Mm -hmm. And I am, what you said is true. I'm trying to shortcut this learning curve for people by, yeah. by helping them get to the basic things that really do work for these top pro photographers, myself included. You're like, that's what I do. You're like the, the Lewis and Clark of photography, right? You, you, that's a good, the right. explorer. Yeah, <laughs> I'm exploring. You know, Map and it's maker, true because writing the path so others don't have to go off the cliff. You know, you can just, you know, take yeah. do what I say and and uh, save yourself a lot of time. But I want to I want to dive into this. So we're so the, the title of this episode, five stages, five stages of photography is based on the first chapter in your book. Um, yeah. And you do a presentation on this and all that. And the take us through that. So I want to dive into in this time, I want to dive into each one of these little segments and yeah. well, big segments, actually, and then have you explode them. So take us through that. What are the five stages? Yeah. So here's the visual, right? OK, so what you've got here is this word visualization at the center 
What does that even mean? Visualization means seeing something in your mind that isn't necessarily present in the in the real world. Mm -hmm. You get an idea. You get your your mental image of it. And Ansel Adams said the whole key to a photograph, you can see this on my YouTube channel. He said the whole key to a photograph is visualizing it before you press the shutter. Hmm. So there's a lot to this. I mean, I have an introduction to it here, but I've written a whole chapter, actually several chapters about what does it mean to visualize a photograph? You get an idea. And that could be, I'm going to go to the mountains, I'm going to go to Yosemite, and I want to come away with these beautiful photographs of Half Dome. That's my vision. I've, I've had visions of, of how I want to do portraiture, but I get an idea beforehand, and then you build from that idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's visualization. You, you, you are not just pressing a shutter randomly. You know where you're going with it. If you think of it like you're going to take a trip somewhere. Last September, my wife and I took a road trip. You know, you couldn't take a plane trip, so we took a road trip. And we drove from, uh, I live in Carmel. We drove from Carmel up through Northern California, through Nevada, Utah. We ended up in Northern or Midway in Montana and then came back and I photographed the entire process. So I visualized this trip. We planned it out which meant that we knew where we were going. We knew what we wanted to look for. I even had some storylines in mind that I wanted to photograph. Now that's really different than saying, and that's way more productive than saying, I'm gonna just get in the car and just see where I end up. Mm -hmm. You could do that, but I think your chances of success diminish because you don't really have this thing figured out. Yeah. And so that's what visualization means. It's like getting the idea before you press the shutter, very mindful in your photography. I love that. And it's, you know, and I've heard that, I've heard that pre-visualization thing before and a lot, a lot of photographers and tell me what you have, what, what you think about this. A lot of yeah. people say, well, you know, I don't want to put myself in a box and it's all about serendipity and chance. And I don't want to miss out on a shot because I was too single minded about the shot that I was getting. What do you say to those folks that are like, you know, I don't I don't want to be on rails. I just I just want to go yeah. out there and capture the world as it presents itself to me. I agree. You know, I actually agree with that. And I think there is a lot to serendipity. But even that has its pre visualization. If you boil it back and you go, well, why did you decide to go to that location to begin with? Yeah. Let's take Henry Cartier-Bresson. OK, the master of capturing the moment. I mean, that was his de decisive moment, right? That's Cartier-Bresson. And you could say, well, he didn't pre visualize. He just was pressing the shutter. I beg to differ. He knew where would be a photo rich environment. And he went there with an idea of what he wanted to capture, which was this decisive moment. Maybe he didn't know that that particular detail would occur, mm -hmm. but I guarantee you he preconceived it. Yeah. And, he, and you, by the way, you can visualize something in a split second. You go, whoa, bam, press the shutter right now. Yeah. That that occurred in a, a millisecond, but there's still this mental radar that you had mm -hmm. that said, I need to pay attention here. You know, Robert Holmes, Bob Holmes, who I've interviewed a lot, amazing National Geographic photographer. You know, he's won the Travel Photography of the Award, Year Award like five times. Amazing photographer. He says, you go into an environment, you just smell there's a photograph. <laughs> right. I, yeah. I know that. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. You smell it. There's something going on. Well, there even that's a bit of a pre visualization. So I don't want people to think that it's a long, laborious process and you you've got to put everything on a tripod or anything. I'm not advocating that. And I'm not advocating everybody being in rails and being in a box. It's it's a way to free yourself and go. Wow, I yeah. am going to go to this environment and I'm going to come away and these are these are some of the ideas I have. So when I see them, I recognize them and I go with it. So that's and my answer applies, to that. This applies to all genres of photography, right? Not just landscape oh, yeah. and, you know, and nature, but also 
fashion, portraiture, and portraiture and sports, sports whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So have an rock idea photography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a rock photographer could go. I understand what the stage looks like. You know, they've already v visualized it and they think, well, if I stand in the press box with all the other 100 photographers, I'm going to get a photograph like pretty much that looks like them. What if I could get and I've done this. What if I could get backstage and shoot from the side? I've done this at the Monterey Jazz Festival. Mm -hmm. And or even they have holes in the back where you can shoot through and see like a really intimate shot of the of the musicians. That's going to look really different than if I'm out here with a big, long telephoto lens like everybody else. That's not so cool. Yeah. So it's like knowing how to how to get that edge. Chris Burkhart mentioned that, you know, he's an amazing photographer. He's got four million people following him on Instagram for a reason. He's just really a great photographer. Yeah. But his point was that, you know, he's shooting sports, he's shooting surfing. And there's 30 guys standing on a cliff all next to each other. Ba bam, ba bam, ba bam, ba bam. He's what? Why would I want to do that? Yeah. So he yeah. goes, he, he visualizes, what if I walked over from this angle and I'm the only guy there? And I get the photograph from that angle. Maybe I can get a cover shot. And he did. Yeah, that's another way of visualizing. It's like Kodak. You remember? Remember back in the day, Kodak used to paint those little little spots on the ground. Stand here to take your oh, boy. photo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the place not to stand, right? Exactly. That's exactly yeah. what that is. If you want the shot that everyone else gets, stand on this spot. That's what it meant. So, and that's a way so. not to have a brand because a brand is about differentiating yourself from everybody else. So let's move so, on from the from the vision. Yeah. So side. after you visualize, then the next thing you need to know is your equipment. And there's no shortcut for that. You do have to know your camera and you, you know, if you use it as a tool of creativity to take your vision and turn it into a photograph, that's the proper way to use it. What I have a beef with is people who just geek out on cameras and that's all they do. Yeah. I mean, I get it. People do that with cars, right? They geek out on cars and they never even Everybody. drive them. They're collector's items in their garage or something. Okay, but that just just label it for what it is. You're collecting cameras. You're not using them. But yeah. you got to know your equipment. You got to know your lens. You got to know what your camera sees. That's a really key component, right? Your camera does not see what your eye sees, guaranteed. First of all, our field of vision is enormous, right? Mm -hmm. And our range of dynamic range is un almost unlimited because our eye just keeps adjusting all the time. Yeah. So we have to know this camera will capture this way in this lighting condition. And that comes from testing and shooting and just knowing. So if you've got a vision in your mind and you use your camera correctly, you should be able to capture that the way you envisioned it. Yeah. So that's knowing that. your equipment and that's your lenses, your lighting, your camera, your tripod, all that stuff. What do you say okay. about like the, you know, you know, there's this, this whole relentless pursuit of gas, right? Gear acquisition syndrome. If it's ah! you know? <laughs> so, so we know what happens with too much gas. It we comes know, out we know. noisily it's, and smelly. Yeah. And you annoy everyone around you. Right. So that's the yeah. problem. So how do you get I, out of that? How do you get out of that? Get off of that, that roller coaster of, I need the next best thing. Oh, that camera focuses faster. This one has a larger sensor or that light does this thing. You know, yeah. how, do you, how do you get out of that? Well, I think that's why this process that I'm going over is so important because you have to realize you're, you're an artist. You're not just artists don't obsess over, you know, Picasso didn't obsess over the brushes that he had. You know, wow, yeah. look at this. This is an amazing brush. I bet he never even talked about them. You know, but yet he probably had the best brushes in the world, but he knew how to use them and to use them as an art form. So I'd say if somebody's stuck in that syndrome, just look at these cameras here. These are amazing cameras that you could do anything in the world with. There's a Rolleiflex, there's a Leica. These are 50 years old. This is a, you know, Hasselblad. These are great cameras. You, they're not the newest. You can do amazing work with this. Yeah. Just 
step out of that for, mm-hmm. you know, and that that's the thing. We're in a very consumer driven field. Let's face it. Yeah. Okay. I get, so, Hey, wow. That's a cool we century. All- you know, I like that, but that, you know, it's easy to get suckered into that, but, but just back away. Don't do that. I used to do something when people would show up in my workshops the first day, you know, multi-day workshop, I'd mm-hmm. give them disposable cameras. Mm-hmm. I'd say the first day you're going to shoot with this disposable camera. There's nothing to geek out about. Mm-hmm. It was one of those few, you remember those Fuji? I don't even know if they still make them, you know, the camera and everything. And then you, yeah, you, yeah. you sent the camera in and got it. So they could not geek out. I wanted their eye present framing, key tools, things like that. So get away from the gas. <laughs> yeah, get, get a, yeah, get away from the gas. Take a gas X and keep rolling. Take a gas X. It does, does you no good. So anyway, once we know our equipment, you do need to know your equipment. Okay, that's different than obsessing about it. Yeah. And by the way, when you're switching your equipment all the time, you're doing yourself a big disservice. Because as you and I know, every new time every new camera you get there's a new learning curve yeah and if you are switching lenses and cameras and da, 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 you're you're adding all these variables constantly into your work it's not going to pay off don't do that yep you never get find never what get works to know the you never get to know the gear intimately so that you can understand how it will perform in different situations it's kind of the problem i think that a lot of people have with um with zoom lenses versus prime lenses so yeah. prime lens you understand when you when you look at something you cut your brain knows what that frame is going to look like with a zoom lens yeah. there's a lot of variation in there so you never really get a hundred percent lock step intimate with the lens because it's yeah. so variable by design right that's true yeah so you got to watch out for that okay the next yep. next part of this is capture Capture means lighting and composition primarily. Mm -hmm. And you need to know the tools of that. I teach people, you know, I wrote this book about composition here and it's got 83 composition tools in it. And I say tools, not rules. Like there is no rule of third where the the photography police are going to give you a ticket because (laughs) you framed it right in the middle. Yeah. I've seen the most brilliant photographs framed dead, dead in the center. Yeah. Right. I've seen yeah. the rule, the rule, the the guideline of thirds, whatever we want to call it. I've seen yeah, it work. Suggestion. <laughs> yeah, but if you follow a formula in your in your composition, it's going to look like you follow the formula. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like cooking, right? If mm-hmm. you're if you're if your cooking looks like it was like paint by numbers or out of a box, it's it's gonna have that, it's gonna taste that way, right? Yeah. That's why you have these great chefs who can bend things around and they learn fusion and whatnot. And it's it's amazing, they took some risks. Yeah. So yeah. composition is a set of guidelines that you can use or not. Yeah. Lighting, similar. You know, lighting, one, one beautiful form of lighting that I really recommend to people is Vermeer lighting. Hmm. I have a window here. Most of what you're seeing is lit because of this one window. I do have an LED over here balancing, Mm -hmm. but you can do amazing work with one light source. Yeah. Yeah. I have pre- Peter that's Hurley. People get lost too, right? Or I mean, with the, with the, cause you'll get online and you see these amazing photographers producing stunning light or stunning shots and they've got a bunch of lights out there. Or you look at, you know, an Andy Leibovitz or somebody in a big studio in New York, and there's this light, yeah. and there's that light, and then there's a little hair light, and then there's a rim light, and then there's this light. If you want that kind of quality, the the logical conclusion is that I need that kind of equipment to do that. You're saying but you no. You don't. You, you yeah. don't. I have Peter Hurley on my show. I love Peter's a good friend of mine. Yeah, I'm and a, you know the he's an amazing. <laughs> the, the yeah the squincher and shebang right. Yes. So what a great guy he is, and yeah. he debunked this whole thing. He showed his little startup studio. He didn't have. He had no lights. He used reflectors from a one window setup, and then he got one light. Got really good at it. So that's. If you're going to use studio lighting, start with one light source. Mm-hmm. In this case, a, 
a window is going to produce flattering light. It's good to know all the different types of natural light that you can shoot in. You know, obviously we know about the golden hours. Mm -hmm. There's a blue hour that occurs after the golden hours where the sky gets very blue. Mm -hmm. That can be an amazing way to shoot. So knowing these things, that's all part of capturing. Love it. Boom. Love it. This is good stuff. Again, that's that's all driven by your vision, right? You go, mm -hmm. I'm standing by this river and it's got this beautiful S curve in it and it's leading up to the Grand Tetons. Wow, I'm going to shoot that, right? There's yeah. my vision and, and then I capture it accordingly. So b before you move on to the next one here, just a, yeah. a quick question on, on visualization. How deep do you think, in your opinion, should photographers go with that? Where, where I'm going with that is, you know, there's a ton of tools out there. We've got these smartphones with GPS and all that and these apps like yeah. Photographers Ephemeris, uh, photo pills, etc., that can tell us where the sun's going to be, where the moon's going to be, where the Milky Way is going to be, <laughs> where the shadows are going to fall on any particular location on Earth at any given yeah. day of the year, right? Should they get to that level of minutia when planning and say, you know what, I want the Milky Way just between those two buildings, so I'm going to go on the 12th of March at this time <laughs> and with this lens and all that? Or, or how deep should they get with that? I, I, I kind of leave that up to each individual i i do use certain tools like i love clouds in my photographs when i'm doing landscapes yeah so i look at the weather i look at my weather app i think that's a helpful tool like i don't want a blue sky mm -hmm. i want weather right yeah. so the weather app says okay it's going to be you know cloudy and it's going to clear off by such and such a time okay i'm going to go out when it's cloudy those are good tools i again Anything can be taken to an extreme and you can geek out on it or whatever. I do feel like research is a huge component to your photography that you should take advantage of what's already been known, what's known about that place that you're going to go shoot. Yeah. You know, when I went to Paris, obviously I knew I had seen certain things that I wanted to photograph and yeah. you have to come up with your own twist on it. Like when you take iconic photographs like the Eiffel Tower or Half Dome, or you know New York City, whatever that's been photographed a zillion times. Come up with your own unique vision for it. And what about contamination? My, my contamination versus inspiration. Like what I mean by that is, <laughs> yeah. you know, in preparation to go to Yosemite and take pictures of Half Dome, you could you could go down one path that says you know what, I need to go look at a bunch of shots so I can get inspired on what I want to shoot so I can do my shot a little bit differently. And then the other path, the contamination path is, I don't want to look at anybody else's shot because I don't want those shots influencing my shot and I don't want to, right. I don't want to subconsciously recreate what they did. What, what do you think about that? I think it lies somewhere in between, you know, yeah. I, you know, I, I do think the more you look at filmmakers like Quentin Tarantino worked at Blockbuster, right? Mm -hmm. And when he was working there, he watched movies. And most of the time, I don't know if he had a night shift thing or something. Most of the time he didn't have anything to do but watch movies. He watched everything yeah. in Blockbuster. Yeah. Okay. Well, this guy has this visual library like huge steven spielberg same thing you man he has everything in his visual library yeah. so whether he uses it or not or whether he likes it or not at least he knows kind of what the range is out there and i find most photographers that that are really really good have a vast vocabulary mm -hmm. not just a photography but classical art as well yeah and I find oh. it's really helpful. Uh, I give a class about this. Joey L, who is an amazing photographer, and he got started on the Twilight film when he was 16 years old. Study with Steve McCurry. Remember this whole thing? Yep. But he got, he, you know, his inspiration is classical art. He wow. says he looks at the framing that the artist used, Rembrandt, Vermeer, uh, you know, uh, these different artists and uses that in in his composition and his lighting. So I I think that really helps. And I as far as contamination, yeah, I get it. You maybe don't want to be in move to do something that you think is copying, but mm -hmm. I, 
I did another interview that's pretty interesting with, um, uh, you know, the story of the Beatles, and they they started off trying to emulate the Everly Brothers. They liked their harmonies, but nobody could ever, nobody's ever going to accuse the Beatles of sounding like the Everly Brothers. Yeah. They just took that and made it into their own brand. Yeah, yeah. So like that's Microsoft what I say. say. Remember, Microsoft used to say, they don't steal, they embrace and extend. <laughs> Steve Jobs just said steal, you know, so he was, yeah. he was steal maybe more honest people. about it. <laughs> so, what, you know, you're, I know you're moving on to processing next. So that's a good segue from, you yeah. know, you were, you were saying when you go out and you shoot, you look for clouds. AI these days, speaking oh, of processing, can replace guys. Do, does, what do you, are you a purist, a sky purist, or do you let the tech take over? You and I had this discussion in 28, 2008. I don't know if you remember that because you were at oh Adobe then. Yeah, yeah. But, but you had to work pretty hard to do cloud replace. Sky replacement comes in Photoshop now. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've played with it. I can't say that I'm that satisfied with it. To me, I can't fool myself. So I, I'm the first customer that has to be impressed and as as much as it there are times where i just wish there was a cloud in the sky i don't know i'm not sure the jury's out on that yeah i i i would for me i'm a little too much of a purist to embrace it i i'm sorry to say but it's you a tool that i may know. find myself using i don't know it's possible okay all right you haven't ruled ladies and gentlemen you heard it here first mark silver has not ruled out <laughs> i haven't ruled it placement. out <laughs> yeah i mean i'm not shooting documentary photo you know journalistic yeah. photos yeah. i'm talking i'm talking about a landscape sure. i look at it kind of like processing audio you know if i'm shooting a, a film and there's some bad audio and i can salvage it through you know processing it correctly i will of course Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's a little that's a little different. I'm a little more of a purist. I, I tend to stick with what's already there. But yeah. processing your images comes as the next stage of this. And processing has its own visualization to it. You know, you may have captured a photograph and not thought about whether it was going to be black and white or color, for instance. But you get back and you put it on your computer and you go, wow, this would really, really look good as a black and white. Boom, that's a new vision. Mm -hmm. And I'll do that. I do that all the time. And I'm a I love black and white photography. I shoot a lot in color, but sometimes I'll go, this is just stronger as a black and white photograph. And I want to process it with as much of a dynamic range as I can get out of it. You know, Ansel Adams taught me that, the zone yep. system, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I want blacks. I want a really dark black and I want our whites and I want everything in between. So I try to do that in my processing. And uh, but whatever it is, you got to process your images. I, I don't think there's any photograph that comes out of any camera. Perfect. Ready to go. As much as they try, you know, like Apple with the iPhones and all the tech that goes into every shot that you press, it's amazing. And they still it's getting, getting pretty close, but it still needs, you know, a little bit of a little bit of salt on there from the photographer. Exactly. It's your, it's your little tweak. Yeah. And then the final part of this is sharing, which is getting your work out to the world. And that's a really fulfilling thing. If you just leave it on your hard drive or you leave it in your phone or you leave it on in prints in a box or something, you're never going to feel that satisfaction of showing your work to other people. Let them see it. And I don't just mean social media. To me, social media is like fast food mm -hmm. because people are going by it like this. How fast do they look at your image, right? Yep. And they click it and they go on to the next one. I'm talking about making prints, putting them on the wall, making mm -hmm. books, making, putting them in videos. That's a really cool way to use your photo photos. Share them with the world. Put them in shows, enter art shows. Uh, yep. Make your own blurb books, whatever, do something that, that makes that a body of work that you can then show to other people. That's the final part of the yeah, process. It brings and it all together. Yeah. You know, with that, with, so I keep going back to the visualization because that was brilliant what you said about that. So 
how much should photographers begin with the end in mind? So you mentioned the sharing piece, right? So if yes. they know that the ultimate goal for this shot or this series of photos I'm doing are going or is Instagram, or they know yes. that the ultimate goal for this shot of Half Dome in Yosemite is going to be big. I want to make a big print to put in my living room. And that's going to inform my mission out there and the composition and all that. Because I know the color palette of the living room. I want browns yeah. in there. So do you, should should the end should the should the end justify the means? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's interesting you're bringing this up because I'm going to do a a show about this on Thursday. I have a webinar I'm doing. I believe, yeah, I believe that the Ansel Adams said you should visualize all the way through to the final print. Where is this going to go? Is it going on your wall? Is it in one of those enormous screen? Remember in his living room, he had those three huge panels. Is it going in a book where it's it's a landscape and there's going to be a gutter right down the middle of it? I mean, I'm just saying this is what the pros do. They have to visualize the, the end product. Is it going to go on a T-shirt? You're right. Yeah. You know, that, that yes. It takes resolution the whole nine yards, right? Yeah, I think you should think it all the way through. And the more you do that, I think the better your work is going to get. Yeah. So it's not random. I love That's it. the answer to that question. I love it. Okay. So let's, about segue, the end result. let's segue into, into speaking of end result, we're, we're nearing the end of this interview. Yeah. Um, this book, Advancing Your Photography, that you have out now, you've got a unique way of selling this book, right? That's right. So, yeah, talk about that. I'm interested. The marketing side of me wants to know. <laughs> okay, so this book, I actually give away to people. If you cover the postage and the shipping, we will basically, you get it for free. So the postage and the shipping, you know, our handling, all the stuff that goes into it, because the stuff that you don't see besides just putting the postage on it is we have to ship it somewhere. We pay for that shipping. We pay for the whole little assembly line. So there's shipping and handling. Mm -hmm. So basically, I'm for nine ninety seven in the U.S., you can get this book, which is about half price if you order it on Amazon right now. Yeah. In the uh, any international order is nineteen ninety seven costs a lot of money for us to ship outside of the country it's a lot of and people. they have to it's a bunch of stuff that goes in you've got to put a customs order in there it's a bunch of work so we'll you cover that part of it we'll we'll give you the book and we have a link for that it's advancing your photography.com that's Excellent. the easy way to find it it's the name of the book easy easy yeah. and is the book available as a as an ebook or pdf or only hard copy it, it is available in many every form that you can imagine. It's available as an ebook, a PDF, which you can also. I should put the. Actually, if you go to my website, you you'll find there's these various forms. That's silverstudios.com. Mm -hmm. It's also available as an audiobook through Audible. Oh, who did the narration? A, um, a guy in England. Yeah, he did Excellent. two of my books. Yeah. Um, his name is Kev Odman, uh, in England and what's cool is I collaborated with him, you know, because my publisher basically hired him and we worked together. Uh, I also have it as a visual book as well. I have a course, an entire course where I've taken this and you get to see me, Mark Silver, not upside down, Mark Silver, not just narrating, but I'm actually I'm telling you everything that's in here, but you know, like every author, you only wrote down a certain amount and the rest of it is still in your head. So mm -hmm. you get to hear all those other like bonus things that I didn't put in the book. And that's mm -hmm. also available through my website. You can see that as well. Amen. But the first thing to start with is get this physical copy. I get want people to have the physical copy because there's a different feel to a book when you when you hold it in your hands and you see the prints and you can mark the pages yeah. and you can put it in your camera bag. I made it the size you could carry it with you. Yeah. So you have the material right there with you. And it's I love that. Look, 997. I twisted I twisted your arm to allow me to give out the first chapter. Still hurting. <laughs> yeah. It's like a vaccine shot. So yeah. the 
The first chapter of that book we're giving away on thisweekinphoto.com. So you can find yeah. this episode. If it's if you're coming to the site later after this is published, just search for Mark Silber and you'll find it. Um, but you know, you can you can grab the the first copy or the first chapter of the yeah. book and then go ahead and purchase it. You know, for shipping only, right? So easy. No reason not to grab it. It's free. So exactly. I want you to have it. And it does yeah. give you the outline that I just ran through with you, basically, in the PDF. I love that. I love that. Yeah. So what's next? What's next? You're always up to something, man. You're always <laughs> up. What, is, what is next on your agenda? I'm creating courses. Uh, my the last book I wrote is called Create, which is about the creative process. And um, so I'm creating a course around this book, or actually a series of courses. So that's my next that's my next big project. And, you know, I have a membership group that we meet together once a week. It's a paid mm -hmm. membership. It's called AYP Plus, AYP Advancing Your Photography. And like right now, I have them on a challenge, a 28-day challenge to create a project. And then we critique them every week. It's really awesome because, mm -hmm. you know, they're getting feedback talk about the sharing part, you know, over here, you're sharing it with a with a group of like minded people who aren't afraid to tell you what they see. Yeah. So that's yeah. another project that I'm doing is teaching. I'm teaching all the time, basically, I one way that. or another. Yeah. And, and I love that you're you're I'm a I'm a big proponent of community as well. And community yeah. driven feedback with with peer oversight, you know, so you're in there kind of wrangling yeah. the cats as it were and people yeah. are giving feedback on others i have a community as well and that the magic that happens inside of those environments is different than what happens kind of in a public forum where people are anonymous Absolutely. and all that you have a paid private area it's almost like i call it the analogy i use is the it's like the airport lounge right exactly you can go, you can go into the airport and hang out at the gate or go into the airport lounge it costs a little bit more but oh my god is it worth it right <laughs> so. yeah you got your american express card and they let you in no absolutely yeah. it's a really good analogy because yeah otherwise you're out there and there's broadcasts going on and interruptions and people are coming yeah. and going and people no people have to qualify <laughs> yeah yeah no i agree and i find that it, it's emulating what i did in art school where we came together once we all had projects we came together once a week we put our photographs on the wall and the group went around and critiqued them and you you know this is your first opportunity to see what resonates and what doesn't what questions people have you don't have to accept it all but at least you're putting your work out there and that's really important I I I 100% agree with that. I think just the creating stuff in a vacuum is is it's discouraging because you're not it getting is. any feedback. You don't know what you did right, you don't know what you did wrong. And if you get if you just show it to friends and family, they're always going to say that's amazing. So And like <laughs> listen, as much as we're all we you know, okay, who doesn't like a like? I mean, we like them. But what does yeah. this really tell you? Nothing. Right? Nothing. There's no feedback. There's no you know, like the kind of feedback I give people is usually less is more, you know, they've got a beautiful frame image, but there's something over on the edge that's just pulling my attention off. Yeah. Like it doesn't need to be there. That's a classical thing in photography and mistake that I see is too many things included in the photograph. Yeah. yeah. And you look at pros, they tend to simplify as a rule. Yeah either through depth of field or cropping, you know, cropping with their feet, moving in a little tighter. Sometimes they move back a little more, you know, yeah. and those are those are interesting tools that you can use. It was interesting because I remember uh, a friend of mine, Alex Lindsay, used to say because he's very plugged into the visual effects industry in Hollywood. He worked on Star Wars, you know, the whole nine wow. years. And he used to say that um, probably still does say it that every frame of a film and everything in that frame and every camera move and every light placement, everything that you see is 100% intentional. There are no mistakes totally. in, in the film. So translate in that film, into yeah. your, yeah, when you translate that into your photography, 
that shot, everything that's in that frame that you choose to present as a finished piece, everything in that, every pixel should be there on purpose with intent, right? Yes. And and I, I was tell I tell people we had this conversation in my community about uh, during our critique sessions we, we were talking about how the edges of the frame are magnetic. I like to think Ooh. of the edges of the frame as being magnetic to your eyeball, right? So, so true. So if you have something so off to the edge, you're going to veer the eyeball off to, and it's going to stick to the edge. So you have to keep the magnetism on the subject as much as you can. Yes. So I even look at my frame and you, you know, I'm violating that because I have this camera here with the shiny, you know, it's a Leica and it's shiny and it's off to the edge of my frame that that you wouldn't want to do that with a photograph mm -hmm. because it our eyes going to go to the shiniest thing. Right. So that you're absolutely right. Scanning the whole frame once not in, in your camera, but scan it again when you're processing it. That's right. Because you can always burn the edges. That's a very classic photography tool, right? Burn your edges. The reason that old time photographers did that is because they wanted to keep the magnetic frame from pulling your eyes out. That's right. Like that. That's right. Yeah. Burning it in or, or, you know, doing a white vignette, whatever. Brings, you could do that too. Brings yeah. the focus in. Yeah. Think of focus as magnetism. You know, you're don't, don't spread it out. This is good, really cool, man. You and I could talk forever. I love I this. <laughs> you and I could talk <laughs> we forever. Could. What? Uh, and I'm coming down to Carmel at some point. We're gonna hang out and have a coffee. When, Absolutely. Uh, when the zombies go away, so we're yeah. definitely, <laughs> definitely we're getting be. closer to that every day. We are. We are very much so. Um, so one final time, if people want to check out the book, they want to go to your website. They want to see what you're working on. Where should they go? advancingyourphotography.com and I think you I bet you'll probably put that URL pretty prominently for everybody so that's how you get the book uh, go to my website silber with a b s i l b e r studios.com and also go to my YouTube channel if you search for Mark Silber so just go to YouTube Mark Silber you'll find that channel and same thing with Instagram Pretty much you can find me by typing my name in the internet. Yeah. It will pop up. I guarantee you there's a lot of Mark Silver stuff out there. Love and it. it's mostly about me. There's another guy that spells his name the same way. He's a musician in Berkeley. We laugh because someone has, I've gotten some of his emails from an old girlfriend. <laughs> that was kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, remember that time we were in Detroit together? I'm like, what? No, I yeah. don't. <laughs> and, uh, that Turned could out be badly if Mark's your name. wife has access to your email, right? <laughs> that, that wouldn't be good. We straightened no. that out right away. It was That's pretty right. funny. <laughs> That's excellent. All right, Mark Silver, thank you for coming on, man. It's always a pleasure catching My up with pleasure, you. My pleasure, Fred. And congratulations on all the things you're, you're working on. I love it that you have this sort of lifelong, unquenchable desire to educate others about photography and light, light fires of enthusiasm in new photographers across the globe. So thank you for doing that. I appreciate you. Thank you, Frederick. Always a pleasure to be on your show. This is Twitter.